I am Stuart Jones, and I'm a platform engineer with Am Digital. Uh, for those of you that haven't heard of us, we're a digital consultancy, about five years old now. Uh, just over 500 people, and we've grown to, I think it's four offices in London, one in Reading, Manchester, Halifax, Leeds, and various others in the pipeline coming up. And we're always hiring. So, what I'm going to talk to you about is some work that we did with one of our clients which was taking their monolithic back-end systems and lifting that out of their data centers into AWS. So we're going to go through the technology we lifted and shifted, or well, not quite just lifted and shifted, lifted, tweaked and shifted. Uh, it's called Hybris. Um, I'm going to go through the various layers of how we deconstructed their existing monolith, um, the pain points that they had before we moved to AWS, look in some detail about how we actually did that move, uh, and then finally get on to the, the future, well, the, the now and future, which is starting to progressively re-platform away from that monolith. Okay. So Hybris is an e-commerce platform um, which allows its consumers to sell in business to business and business to consumer markets effectively. Um, it does have supposedly several standout features which build on this which allow you to develop a full omnichannel solution. That's the uh, marketing blurb at least. Uh, from our perspective it's a big, heavy, big heavyweight Java based application. So, once we got into uh, the customer, we figured out the way that they had deployed Hybris and had been running it for several years was essentially four layers. At the bottom, they'd got a full Oracle rack cluster. Uh, they had a search layer running Apache Solar, which we'll touch on a bit more on the next slide. Uh, at the application layer, they actually had the Hybris product, so that's the the actual Java application that's running, um, a load of bespoke code around that core Hybris product, um, the means of importing and exporting data, uh, which wasn't done directly into the database, it was done through custom layer at that level, and a load of shared media file mounts. So essentially this company is uh, an online retailer. So all of the images that were, the product images that were shared on their website were stored down at that layer. And on top of that, the front end layer, we had um, an Apache layer using mod JK. So that was used to essentially load balance traffic and maintain sticky sessions between servers, uh, which was largely based on the J session ID. So this was the existing, well, the original production environment. Uh, one of the problems they had was that other environments weren't consistently sized or configured. So these things have been hand-built over time. Uh, your development environment had nowhere near as many nodes for licensing and hardware cost reasons. QA was still at a point where people didn't fully trust it. If something wasn't quite working in QA, there was always the argument of, it's not quite the same as production, so it's probably an issue with QA, so let's just carry on anyway. Um, and also they had it split into four sets of servers for four use cases. So this is the application tier here. Um, they had a cluster for their internal contact center, a cluster for the actual public facing web interface, cluster for the back office and then some separate nodes down at the bottom for doing batch processing. In addition, this solar search layer down at the bottom there, that wasn't actually highly available. So even though they had um, worker nodes to allow a higher number of reads, if the master node went down, the master node was the only one that held the indexes. So 
search across the entire production website would fall over if that one component died. So a little more on the, uh, on the pain points. Manual deployments were taking five to six hours to complete every time they wanted to deploy Hydris updates. Um, essentially, they're taking a server out of the live cluster, upgrading it, testing it, and then putting it back into the cluster. It was all done manually. Uh, there was no automation around it, no automated testing or anything like that. Obviously, as I touched on before, the platforms were inconsistent. So moving from dev to QA to pre-prod to production, you've got no guarantee that the environments had actually been set up in the same way. So what that meant was there was a, a lot of the testing was essentially happening quite late on in the cycle. So that was causing problems in terms of delayed releases, really slow release velocity, and essentially a load of wasted time. There was no agility. Obviously, this, this was all on-premise, uh, hosted in VMware, in VMs. And if they needed to build additional environments, if they needed to expand and scale, then it was bring the procurement guys and order a load of servers, wait however many weeks for the server manufacturer to deliver them. You know, all the, all the bad things that cloud gets rid of. Additionally, uh, there was no centralized logging function. So all of the logging was done on the individual cluster nodes themselves. And what this meant was the operations, and in some cases even the developers, had full access to SSH onto the servers. And what this led to was the fact that some of the developers weren't just looking at log files, they were changing config files, nothing was documented, and you just essentially got a load of people scratching their heads when things went wrong because you were missing out those auditable steps that automation would give you. There was no self-healing to the whole process, so if one of these servers died, somebody had to spin up a new virtual server install the operating system on it, or at least come from a, an OS template, and then layer the latest version of Hybris, the latest version of the co core code on, test it all, and then bring it back into the cluster. One of the challenges they had was nobody in the business had any cloud experience, which is why they turned to a consultancy. Um, so we essentially, uh, came upon uh, quite a lot of resistance at first. Obviously, people in the, in the web operations team kind of worried for their jobs. You know, what's going, what's going to happen here? You know, I'm a DBA, I'm a network engineer. If you move all this stuff to the cloud, where does that leave me? Um, and essentially, we took them on the journey with us from the start. So you had people who were DBAs, network engineers, who now have been trained up and have the skills and ability to own and manage and maintain the AWS environment going forwards. So in terms of how we actually moved, what we did was we looked to see what can we automate, and the answer was a heck of a lot. Obviously automation gives you speed, it gives you consistency, it gives you traceability as opposed to people SSHing onto servers and issuing random commands and not telling anyone they've done it. The next phase was we looked at each of those four tiers and we critically reviewed and rationalized the tiers. We didn't re-architect the whole thing. We didn't say, we're gonna whack this in a container and use containers from, from, the scr from scratch. We didn't say we're gonna completely throw it away and rebuild it in a different model. We needed to make some incremental changes to what was already there to improve it and to work out which AWS services or which other third party software as a service or platform as a service type approaches fit for those layers that we are migrating. So the conclusion was we needed to essentially do the least amount of re-architecting in order to allow us to have a scalable platform that would self-heal. So that was essentially doing the, doing the minimum to move it, to get them into the cloud, 
and give, but then give them the agility to keep moving it forwards and keep making incremental improvements from there. So the tech stack that we ended up using, obviously AWS, that's why we're all here. Uh, Terraform was used to actually build the environments. Uh, in terms of the core servers, we had AMIs built using Packer. Um, obviously, we using uh, GitLab on the back end. We're using Jenkins for the pipelines and Puppet to actually get the initial config onto those AMIs once they've been deployed. Uh, all the deployments now are automated, not manual. I say automated, they're not fully automated. This is obviously quite a legacy company with legacy culture. They still have weekly cab meetings to approve changes and you're not just going to immediately walk in and make a big bang change and get people who are used to sitting in a meeting with 20 people every week to approve changes to suddenly say we don't need this anymore you've got to take them on that journey which we are doing but it's it's a slow and painful process and you get to the point where yes we can do this full automation up to pre-production but there still needs to be a a final approval manual button press to actually trigger the production deployment. It's still automated once it's triggered. It's not just, essentially, it's just that manual review step. Um, obviously, because we're using Puppet, we've got that self-healing capability in there. If anyone does manage to SSH onto servers and start changing settings, in theory, Puppet should set everything back as it was. Um, <coughs> We've essentially got the platform to the point where if we want to build a new one from scratch completely, it takes one hour, 20 minutes, as opposed to, I think it was about nine weeks in the, uh, in the old world, which is obviously a massive improvement. And that nine weeks doesn't even include buying servers. Uh, we're saving them money um, so that a lot of the platforms get turned off at 10 p.m. every night and we bring them back up at 6 a.m., but when we bring them back up, we autom automatically put the nightly builds on at least dev and QA. So the developers every morning have got a nice, fresh platform to work with. It's clean, it's consistent. No matter what they did to screw it up the previous day, they know that the next morning they'll be kind of back to where they were with the latest working nightly build. So now we're going to look at the four layers and how we actually transition those layers into the cloud. So the Apache layer, as essentially this was doing load balancing, uh, we put that through an elastic load balancer, which is dead easy and simple, and a lot, you know, AWS allows you to configure it in a very straightforward manner. We used the Fastly content delivery network. Uh, we did look at um, CloudFront, but at the time CloudFront wouldn't allow us to configure redirects, and it also wouldn't allow us to kind of host and serve static pages in one hit. So Fastly was picked as the, the best product fit for that. So in some ways we've kind of, we've moved some stuff out of that application layer, those static image files are now served at the end, at the edge, then they never come into our network. Well, they never come into the client's network, or even the client's AWS account. They're all held at that higher level. Obviously, that gives faster page load times. So, you know, it's a win all around. On the application layer, um, as I alluded to before, we're using AMIs built with Puppet. Uh, we've got Jenkins pipeline that deploys the new instances into an auto-scaling group with a particular AMI image. And any more dynamic media is stored uh, on EFS. So rather than having um, shared, like monolithic shared storage within a VMware environment or having to replicate data across, we're using the standard out-of-the-box EFS solution. Um, we did look at containerization, but again, this is a company that's very much on the start of its cloud journey. Um, 
the containerized image would have been over 10 gig, I think it was. Um, and I think we just felt that they weren't, the business was used to VMs and that EC2 was a much easier sell than this magic voodoo Docker stuff that they, I think, just scared them, to be honest. Uh, we, I'll come on to it later, we asked, you know, they are now on their container journey, but for this you know, kind of the core business critical system, Docker was uh, probably never going to be an option at the start. So the search layer, again, this is, uh, this is all EC2 for the same reason. It's auto-scaling clusters. Um, we're running something called Zookeeper, which is a cluster manager for Solar Cloud, which is the clustered version of Solar. So with that, we now get the full, um, full high availability, full replication. If one of those nodes goes down, it's absolutely fine. Um, and obviously that puts them in a much better situation than they were previously where essentially if they lost one particular VM that completely screwed the, the uh, public facing website. And then this looks really simple but actually this was the most difficult part of the lot is how do you lift and shift a 400 gigabyte Oracle database that's essentially needs to be up 24-7 with as little downtime as possible into AWS. Uh, we got a lot of good support from uh, AWS's own RDS specialists on this. Um, fundamentally, the problems we ran into was the data center where the existing database was hosted. The internet connection just wasn't good enough. So going over a VPN, we were getting 12 megabytes per second. Even if you took the VPN out of the way, we were only getting 17 megabytes per second across, um, across the public internet. So eventually, we came up with a hybrid solution, which was we, with Oracle's blessing and AWS's blessing, spun up our own EC2 instances with Oracle installed installed uh, something called Oracle Data Guard on that, which then allows you to essentially synchronize two databases. So you restore a backup that's old, and then Data Guard will only sync the log data across. So instead of trying to take a backup and, and bring it over the network, you're, it doesn't matter that it's out of date because over the next 6, 12, 18 hours, however long it, it takes, it will ideally, hopefully, synchronize, which it did. And at the point where it did synchronize, we then flipped the two databases, so the one in the cloud was now the master, and then we took it offline. And at the point we'd taken it offline, we could then very quickly export it, well, as quickly as you can export a 400 gig database, but by now we're in AWS land, so exporting a 400 gig database in AWS and then importing it into RDS. Total downtime was about three hours, which was acceptable. Where I was trying to ship a backup over the internet was taking in excess of 24 hours, which obviously wasn't acceptable. Um, so that is now a fully managed RDS database, but obviously there's, there's a bit of pain there in if you have got a large database to move, it's it's not trivial. So this is the resultant architecture um, in a kind of more logical state. What you've actually got here is these clusters of hybris no nodes in the middle are actually largely shared. So it's only the um, batch processing that has its own cluster. We figured out that uh, in contrast to the 12 VMs that they were running things on originally, we actually only needed five. There have been some assumptions based on the Hybris documentation that Hybris was a memory-bound product. But when we actually got things into AWS and after a couple of days of running it and monitoring it, we quickly realized it wasn't 
memory bound at all. It was actually CPU bound. So purely by changing the instance sizes, we were able to service all three of the kind of web facing, be it internal or external web facing tiers using a shared cluster of five nodes. Um, for performance reasons, we still kept a separate mini cluster there for the, uh, for the batch processing. Uh, the only other thing is we used a portion of Oracle Fusion middleware called ODI, which um, deals with a lot of um, scheduled jobs. And in hindsight, we probably should have done that using Lambda. At the time, they had the, as part of the whole Oracle thing, they had lots of Fusion stuff in there. It seemed like a good fit, but actually the implementation of it was more difficult than than relying on lambdas would be, especially given in a lot of cases it was just moving files between a local file system and EFS, that kind of thing. So what this has uh, left them with is they can actually do fast automated deployments. Um, we can auto scale now, so if there's a sudden surge in traffic, uh, it does take about 20 minutes to bring a new node online, but that's, at least they can bring new nodes online now, whereas previously they couldn't. Um, they are using proactive scaling for major events, so if they have a big marketing push, they can obviously scale up. Um, previously, that kind of thing used to require at least eight weeks planning because they would have to go out and procure hardware and actually get the additional VM capacity in place to allow them to do that. So you know, the business has really felt that, um, felt that benefit, particularly the marketing side of things. They can be more agile. They've also got consistent environments now. So crucially, if something's tested on dev and it's tested on QA and it goes into pre-prod, you're not getting weird behavioral changes due to environmental differences. And particularly once you've got it to pre-prod, you're 99.999% certain that when you push the button to put it into production, it's all gonna work fine. Uh, it's saving them money as well. So the uh, data center costs they had previously uh, per month for essentially a bunch of inconsistent platforms. They were paying more than $27,000 a month. Uh, at the minute, that's now down to $21,000. Um, that's only at a 40% reservation rate. So because they've still been essentially tuning what the load looks like and learning more about things, they've been fairly um, cautious about over committing to reservations but they are planning to add additional reservations in the coming weeks and months, um, and they expect to at least get that down to uh, 19,000 a month by the end of the year. So what next? We're now in a phase of progressive replatforming. So the end goal is to actually get rid of this legacy Hybris product. It's not cheap. Um, it's been bought by SAP, who well, the combination of SAP and Oracle license fees is significant, as I'm sure many of you all know. So the beauty is now that we've got this in AWS, it becomes very easy to extend it and allow access to other AWS services. So already we've got API gateways in place and we've started them down the microservices journey, starting to split elements out of their monolith. So now you've got the front end. The front end's gonna stay as it is, but the front end now, instead of talking to Hybris and Oracle on a, on a per function basis, is now starting to talk to microservices. And that's something that's accelerated over, I think over the last two or three months, they've gone from one microservice to 11 that are currently in development, and it's one of these things, it's sudden everyone's now on board and sees the, the benefits of it and is 
potentially going to be uh, exponential growth over the next year or two. Um, currently, uh, on the back end of that, we're using AWS Fargate. Um, EKS and ECS self-managed were both looked at, but at the time with it, again, the concerns about lack of containerization um, knowledge and ability, it was felt that a managed service was actually the, the preferred approach for that. Um, but obviously this whole approach, particularly with API gateways in place, it does open it up to the ability to use lambdas and other technologies in the future as and when they're ready for that part of the journey. So that's pretty much the end um, of everything I've got to say other than to reiterate the kind of key, th key takeaway in all of this was actually taking the existing team and getting them um, up to speed, building the internal capability. So we're, we're there assisting them and supplanting them, but we've taken people who thought that cloud was a threat and we've turned it into a big opportunity for them. So that's it. Thank you. Dave? Sorry. Any questions? Oh, what? Oh, I can see. Sorry. <laughs> I thought you had a question. I was coming to you. Uh, you mentioned using Fastly for the content delivery. Yep. Is there any reason you didn't use S3 and CloudFront? Uh, I think it was around some of the redirect behavior that they wanted couldn't natively be done using CloudFront. So, yeah. Anyone else? No, I think we're done. Okay, thanks very much, Stuart. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.